Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 157. Today's big Bible question, why do people believe the Bible is against interracial marriage? So hello, friends. Happy Wednesday. We are living in a crazy world right now, right? So today's topic is not exactly precipitated by the current protests in the United States at the moment, but it is a topic that is important to go over, even though we have already touched on it a little bit up around 150, 147 episodes ago in episode number 10, uh, which was called, Does the Bible Forbid Interracial Marriage? Now, I think that topic is worth covering again because we do have a lot of new listeners and we just so happen to uh, get today to a passage that is very pertinent to the discussion in Scripture. And this episode has been written from scratch today, so there should be very little repetition. That said, the issue of race, racism in the Bible is something that's really very close to my heart. Uh, I'm a child of the South growing up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 70s and 80s. My dad was a lawyer, and he actually handled quite a few civil rights cases and things like that, and we lived in an affluent, uh, privileged area of Birmingham. One day when I was in second grade, I had a friend from school over to play with me. His name was Alex. We didn't call it a play date back then, and we still don't because that is such a weird phrase, but we were playing in front of our house in that affluent neighborhood, and my parents actually that night received calls from neighbors complaining and warning them that I was playing with a black kid. And can you imagine the kind of mindset that would say, you know what, I need to pick up the phone and do something about this. It it just even to this day, it infuriates me. Well, about three years ago, I wrote a book called The Bible and Racism, which is of course available on Amazon. Though I haven't mentioned it or posted about it in months on any of my social media or whatever, maybe not even years, the current controversy has it selling pretty briskly, which, you know, is kind of weird, I guess. You can check the book out if you like, but there's a certain sense where I believe white people should do more listening on race issues these days than talking and writing, and I'm sure that there are some sections or paragraphs of that book, because it was written three years ago, Uh, that are tone deaf to what my brothers and sisters of color have to live through on a daily basis. I can try to understand, but the fact is I just can't fully put myself into their shoes. And so that's kind of very limiting in trying to understand something that's so significant and important. So I don't want to talk too much. I want to do more listening. Well, today's Bible readings include Deuteronomy chapter 7, Psalms 90, Isaiah 35, and Revelation chapter 5. And our focus passage is in Deuteronomy 7 because it contains instructions to the Israelites before they enter the promised land, and that those instructions include the prohibition on marrying any of the Canaanites. Now, does this mean that interracial marriage is forbidden by God? Well, it does not. And people who think that way are either being, you know, just overall ignorant of what the Bible says or much worse than that. The below, I'm going to read a little section from my book. It details a run-in I had online with a group of white supremacists that were attempting to twist today's passage, Deuteronomy 7, to justify their abominable evil beliefs. So in 2007, I posted a mock-up of the cover of the book, The Bible and Racism, on my Facebook page. That was a couple of weeks before I was going to post it, but I'd already had the cover back, and I just wanted to share it with people. I included a two-word description of the picture that said, current project and nothing else. Now, that post at the time was one of the more controversial posts I've ever made on Facebook. It generated lots of likes and uh, 150 or so comments, which for me is a pretty high number for one of my posts. I'm no Kardashian or anything like that. And the reason for that many comments is that within about 15 minutes of posting the picture, one of my Facebook friends, and I'm doing the quotey thing with my finger right now uh, because I do have a lot of Facebook friends and I don't know all of them. I mean, I have close to 5,000. I don't know most of them, in fact. So this is a lady I've never met before. I don't know her in real life. I don't think I had any friends in common with her. Well, she posted an excerpt from the book of Deuteronomy in response to my 
picture. So I read the excerpt with uh, some degree of curiosity, trying to discern what in the world her comment meant. It had no context other than the verse itself, Deuteronomy 7, 3, which is a prohibition that was aimed at the Israelites, commanding them not to marry foreign wives in the promised land. For years, racists and people who have utterly misunderstood the Bible have used that passage and a few others like it to decry interracial marriage, interracial relationships, and those sorts of things. So, Reading Deuteronomy 7 as a current prohibition against Christians marrying somebody of a different nationality or skin color is a tragic misunderstanding of Scripture that completely disregards who the Old Testament was written to and the context of these commandments in Deuteronomy. For one, as we've discussed before, we're not under the law anymore. And for two, which really should be one, this is the most important for this discussion, the prohibition against the prohibition against marriage that the Israelites received was not about interracial marriage it was about interreligion marriage as we're going to find out when we read Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and he drives out many nations before you the Hethites the Girgashites the Amorites the Canaanites the Perizzites the Hivites and Jebusites seven nations more numerous and powerful than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you and you defeat them, you must completely destroy them. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them and you must not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will swiftly destroy you. Instead, this is what you are to do to them. Tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their carved images. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord has had his heart set on you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors, he brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. But he directly pays back and destroys those who hate him. He will not hesitate to pay back directly the one who hates him. So keep the command, the statutes and ordinances that I'm giving you to follow today. If you listen to and are careful to follow these ordinances, the Lord your God will keep his covenant loyalty with you as he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will bless your offspring and the produce of your land, your grain, new wine, and fresh oil, the young of your herds, and the newborn of your flocks, and the land he swore to your ancestors that he would give you. You will be blessed above all peoples. There will be no infertile male or female among you or your livestock. The Lord will remove all sickness from you. He will not put on you all the terrible diseases of Egypt that you know about, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. You must destroy all the peoples the Lord your God is delivering over to you and not look on them with pity. Do not worship their gods, for that will be a snare to you. If you say to yourself, these nations are greater than I, how can I drive them out? Do not be afraid of them. Be sure to remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. The great trials that you saw, the signs and wonders, the strong hand and outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples you fear. The Lord your God will also send hornets against them until all the survivors and those hiding from you perish. Don't be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, a great and awesome God, is among you. The Lord your God will drive out these nations before you little by little. You will not be able to destroy them all at once, otherwise the wild animals will become too numerous for you. The Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. He will hand their kings to you, over to you, and you will wipe out their names under heaven. No one will be able to stand against you. You will annihilate them. Burn up the carved images of their gods. Don't covet the silver and gold on the images and take it for yourself, or else you will be ensnared by it, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring any detestable thing into your house, or you will be set apart for destruction like it. You are to abhor and detest it utterly, because it is set apart for destruction. 
So, does this passage forbid interracial marriage? Well, beyond question, it does not. It forbids the Israelites from marrying the the inhabitants of the promised land that they were about to conquer. Now, we know this from the what the passage said and the fact that it, it pointed out the reason being their religion, but we also know it from the fact that Moses was married to a black African woman from Cush. Yes, let me say that again. Moses was married to a black African woman from Cush. The Jews were not allowed to intermarry with Canaanites, not because of the color of their skin. They probably looked virtually the same, but very clearly because of their religion. By this command, God sought to keep the hearts of the Israelites pure, and their worship focused solely on him in keeping with the first commandment, uh, do not have any other gods, the first of the Ten Commandments, that is, do not have other gods besides me. It had nothing to do with keeping their blood pure. Now, suspicious of this woman's post and wondering why in the world she chose to post that particular scripture on a book that was about race in the Bible, I went to check out my, quote, friend's Facebook page and discovered a trove of highly racist memes, racist comments and claims, and all sorts of just horribly offensive and inaccurate material, including a ridiculous picture that alleges that the Bible is only about white people, that Adam was a white person, and any attempt to describe the Bible as a book about mixed races is completely false. I mean, my eyes almost rolled from... Uh, broke from rolling back in my head. It was just, it was utter racist claptrap. I was incensed, disgusted, and deeply troubled at the level of false teaching that she was promulgating and claiming to be a Christian, which is infuriating. So I challenged her comment on my Facebook page with some degree of um, firmness. This, as you might imagine, ignited one of those comment wars that are more and more common. This was in 2017, remember? Uh, now it's extremely common. And she apparently tagged in several of her white nationalist racist friends. And uh, without any effort or whatever on my part, several of my friends joined in. And so there was a big fight on my page, which I tried to avoid at all costs on social media. Social media is not for arguing, but her stuff was just so wrong. And uh, anyway, her primary henchman, and I think that's an appropriate word for the situation, he was a henchman. He was a German Nazi white supremacist that claimed to love the Jews. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty strange conversation. In fact, the first commenter herself claimed to be a Jewish person, despite the fact that she was quite clearly a Southern American. So, this whole thing was a new flavor of racism for me at the time, and upon a little bit of research, I discovered there was quite a few people who make the claim that the Israelites were white, Adam was white, Jesus was white, and that the only race that is eligible for salvation is the white race. Ugh. According to these white supremacists' abominable teachings, no other race is eligible for salvation. The Bible is about white people and was only written to white people. Thus, according to my friend's henchman, Racism is actually a kindness and displays love because it's communicating the will of God. What a disgusting, horrific, and ignorant idea. As we've discussed before, Jesus was a Middle Eastern man. He was from the Middle East. He was olive-skinned, really not white at all or black, just sort of somewhere in the middle. Given that reality, any sort of Christian racism or white supremacy is disgusting, evil. It's illogical. It's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's small-minded, selfish, and honestly worthy of the harshest condemnation. It's also worthy of ridicule due to the simple fact that Jesus was not white. Yes, the King of Kings was not white. He was Middle Eastern. So I think that White supremacy, in addition to being just horrible, is also a logical farce for anybody that claims to be a follower of Jesus, uh, not to mention the fact that it, it just white supremacy just overall just completely ruled out by Scripture. Okay, back to the main question. Does the Bible forbid interracial marriage? No, not in the least. Oh, and by the way, there were a couple of people in the Bible who did actually have a hard time with interracial marriage. These were Moses' siblings, Miriam and Aaron, who spoke out strongly against Moses' marriage to the black Cushite woman. 
How did that go for them? Well, God disciplined them strongly and struck Miriam with leprosy. It would seem, as R.C. Sproul has said, that God has a much greater problem with racists than he does with interracial marriage. The Bible does not forbid interracial marriage, but it does in every way possible forbid racism of any kind towards any race. Well, let's keep reading. Psalm chapter 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. You return mankind to the dust, saying, return descendants of Adam. For in your sight, a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by, like a few hours of the night. You end their lives, they sleep. They are like grass that grows in the morning. In the morning it sprouts and grows. By evening it withers and dries up. For we are consumed by your anger. We are terrified by your wrath. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days ebb away under your wrath. We end our years like a sigh. Our lives last seventy years, or, if we are strong, eighty years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? Your wrath matches the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Lord, how long? Turn and have compassion on your servants. Satisfy in the morning with us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad all our days. Make us rejoice for as many days as you have humbled us For as many years as we have seen adversity, let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. Wow. Well, that last part is a great prayer for quarantine, is it not? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a wild flower. It will blossom abundantly and will also rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hand, steady the shaking knee. Say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool, and the thirsty land springs. In the haunt of jackals in their lairs there will be grass, reeds, and papyrus. A road will be there and away. It will be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks the path. Fools will not wander on it. There will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing, crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. Amen. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw... on. In the right hand of the one seated on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, look. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slaughtered and you purchased people by God, for God, by your blood, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. 
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their numbers was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. Wow. Today was some great passages, my friends. May the word of God bless you. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Good day, friends. Godspeed.